In July of 1969, the world held its breath as Apollo 11 prepared to attempt what had only been imagined in science fiction and ambitious speeches, landing human beings on the moon. The United States, still locked in the Cold War and in fierce competition with the Soviet Union, saw this mission as more than just science. It was a demonstration of technological might and national resolve. The crew chosen for this historic journey were Neil Armstrong, a test pilot known for his calm precision, Edwin Buzz Aldrin, an expert in rendezvous techniques and space operations, and Michael Collins, the command module pilot tasked with keeping the mothership, Columbia, safe in lunar orbit. Each man had undergone years of training, not only in spacecraft systems, but also in geology, survival scenarios, and simulations of nearly every possible failure NASA engineers could imagine. Apollo 11 launched from Cape Kennedy on July 16, 1969. The Saturn V rocket, standing taller than the Statue of Liberty and generating over 7.5 million pounds of thrust, roared into the sky, carrying the hopes of millions. After three days in transit, the spacecraft slipped into lunar orbit, circling the moon like explorers approaching an alien world. On July 20th, the lunar module, Eagle, detached from Columbia. Armstrong and Aldrin descended slowly toward the lunar surface, while Collins orbited above, utterly alone but focused on his responsibilities. The descent was not without danger. As they approached their landing site, Armstrong realized the onboard computer was guiding them toward a boulder-strewn field. With only seconds of fuel left, he manually took control and guided the Eagle to a safe patch of ground in the Sea of Tranquility. At 10.56 p.m. Eastern Time, Armstrong climbed down the ladder and uttered the immortal words, That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Millions watched live broadcasts as humanity took its first step on another celestial body. Aldrin joined soon after, describing the lunar surface as magnificent desolation. The pair planted the American flag, deployed scientific instruments, and collected samples of moon rock and soil. After 21 hours on the lunar surface, Armstrong and Aldrin lifted off to rejoin Collins, completing what was arguably the most extraordinary voyage in human history. Apollo 11's success fulfilled President John F. Kennedy's 1961 challenge to land a man on the moon and return him safely to Earth before the decade's end. It was not only a technological triumph, but also a symbolic victory in the space race. Apollo 11 had proven it could be done, but Apollo 12 aimed to prove that landing on the moon could be repeated with accuracy and greater scientific focus. Launched in November 1969, the second lunar landing mission carried astronauts Charles Pete Conrad, Richard Gordon, and Alan Bean. Apollo 12's objectives were ambitious demonstrate a pinpoint landing near a pre-selected target and carry out extended scientific experiments on the surface. Conrad, the mission commander, was known for his humor and confidence, traits that made him well-suited to the pressures of exploration. Alan Bean, serving as the lunar module pilot, had a strong interest in art and science, which later influenced the way he reflected on the moon through his paintings. Gordon remained in lunar orbit, operating the command module, Yankee Clipper. The launch itself nearly ended in disaster. Just seconds after liftoff, lightning struck the Saturn V rocket, knocking out telemetry and triggering alarms across mission control. Quick thinking by flight controllers and Conrad's steady composure saved the mission. Systems were reset, and Apollo 12 continued on its path to the moon. On November 19th, Conrad and Bean piloted the lunar module Intrepid to a landing site in the ocean of storms. Demonstrating NASA's growing mastery of lunar navigation, Conrad guided Intrepid to within just a few hundred meters of the Surveyor 3 spacecraft, an unmanned probe that had landed on the moon two years earlier. This precision landing showcased that future missions could target specific areas of scientific interest with confidence. During their moonwalks, Conrad and Bean collected rock samples, deployed a suite of scientific instruments known as the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiments Package, ALSEP, and even retrieved parts from the Surveyor 3 probe for study back on Earth. Their time on the surface was marked 
not only by science, but also by moments of levity. Conrad, significantly shorter than Armstrong, joked upon stepping onto the moon. Whoopee. Man, that may have been a small one for Neil, but that's a long one for me. Apollo 12 returned safely, proving that the success of Apollo 11 was not a singular achievement, but the beginning of a new era of lunar exploration. With precision landings now possible, NASA could aim future missions at geologically diverse sites, expanding humanity's understanding of the moon's history and structure. Apollo 13, launched in April 1970, was intended to be the third lunar landing. Its crew, James Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes, were prepared to explore the Fram Morrow Highlands, a geologically interesting region of the moon. But instead of another step forward in lunar exploration, Apollo 13 became a gripping tale of survival that tested NASA's ingenuity to the limit. Two days after launch, as the spacecraft cruised toward the moon, an oxygen tank in the service module ruptured with an explosion that reverberated through the cabin. Warning lights flashed, power levels dropped, and the spacecraft systems began to fail one after another. Swigert's calm but chilling report to Mission Control summed it up. Houston, we've had a problem. The explosion crippled the service module, depriving the crew of oxygen, power, and propulsion. The lunar landing was immediately aborted. The mission shifted from exploration to rescue. Engineers in Houston and the astronauts themselves had to improvise solutions in real time. The lunar module, Aquarius, originally designed to support two astronauts for two days, became a lifeboat for all three men for nearly four days. Rationing water, enduring freezing conditions, and battling rising levels of carbon dioxide, the crew relied on ingenuity and discipline. In one of the most famous examples of engineering under pressure, NASA teams on the ground devised a way to adapt square command module filters to fit the round openings of the lunar module system, using only the limited supplies available on board. With duct tape, plastic bags, and cardboard, the astronauts built the makeshift device that saved their lives. The return to Earth required precise trajectory corrections. Without the main engine, the astronauts had to use the lunar module's small thrusters to steer their crippled spacecraft around the moon and back toward Earth. Each burn had to be executed with split-second timing to ensure they would not miss Earth's atmosphere entirely. On April 17th, Apollo 13 splashed down safely in the Pacific Ocean. Though it never reached the moon, the mission was hailed as a successful failure. It demonstrated the resilience of the astronauts the brilliance of NASA engineers, and the extraordinary teamwork that turned near tragedy into triumph. Apollo 13 reminded the world that space exploration was inherently dangerous, but also that human ingenuity could overcome overwhelming odds. The shadow of Apollo 13 loomed large over Apollo 14, launched in January 1971. NASA needed to prove that it could still land safely on the moon and carry out meaningful science. The crew chosen for the mission were Alan Shepard, the first American in space, Stuart Rusa, the command module pilot, and Edgar Mitchell, the lunar module pilot. For Shepard, Apollo 14 was a personal redemption. A decade earlier, he had been grounded by an inner ear disorder after his historic Mercury flight in 1961. Now restored to flight status, he was determined to make his mark on lunar exploration. The mission was not without difficulties. Docking the command module Kitty Hawk with the lunar module Antares required multiple attempts, and the lunar module itself experienced technical alarms during descent. But Shepard and Mitchell pressed forward, landing in the From Morrow region, the very site intended for Apollo 13. Their surface operations emphasized geology more than ever before. NASA wanted not just footprints on the moon, but real science. Shepard and Mitchell collected nearly 43 kilograms of lunar material and deployed advanced experiments to study seismic activity, solar wind, and the moon's magnetic field. Despite the seriousness of the mission, Shepard injected a moment of levity into lunar history. Pulling out a makeshift six-iron club he had smuggled aboard, he struck two golf balls across the lunar surface, quipping that one went miles and miles and miles. 
It was a symbolic gesture, blending humanity's spirit of play with the stark desolation of another world. Apollo 14 restored confidence in the Apollo program after the near disaster of Apollo 13. It marked a transition toward more scientifically rigorous lunar missions, setting the stage for the final and most ambitious Apollo expeditions. Apollo 15, launched in July 1971, represented a new phase of lunar exploration. Longer stays, greater mobility, and deeper scientific focus. The crew, David Scott, Alfred Wardens, and James Irwin, were tasked with exploring the Hadley Apennine region, a site of striking geological diversity. What set Apollo 15 apart was the introduction of the Lunar Roving Vehicle, or Moon Buggy. This electric-powered rover expanded the astronauts' range dramatically, allowing them to travel kilometers from the lunar module and carry heavier loads of rock and equipment. For the first time, humanity could drive on the surface of another world. Scott and Irwin conducted three moonwalks, totaling over 18 hours. They explored craters, collected samples from the Apennine Mountains, and investigated a feature known as Hadley Rill, a deep channel believed to be formed by ancient volcanic activity. Among their finds was the Genesis Rock, a sample of a Northosite thought to date back to the moon's earliest crust, offering vital clues to its formation. The mission also featured a poignant symbolic gesture. During their final moonwalk, Scott performed a small ceremony honoring fallen astronauts and cosmonauts, placing a plaque and a figurine called the Fallen Astronaut on the lunar surface. Apollo 15 pushed the boundaries of lunar science, demonstrating that the moon was not just a barren wasteland, but a rich geological archive waiting to be explored. The mission's success highlighted the value of mobility and extended exploration, proving that astronauts could be both explorers and field scientists on another world. Apollo 16, launched in April 1972, targeted the Descartes Highlands, a region believed to be volcanic in origin. The crew, John Young, Charles Duke, and Thomas Mattingly, faced one of the most technically demanding missions yet. Shortly after entering lunar orbit, a malfunction in the command module's engine threatened to derail the landing. Engineers on the ground worked tirelessly to ensure the problem would not prevent the lunar module from lifting off the surface. After tense hours of troubleshooting, the mission proceeded. Young and Duke landed the lunar module, or IN, in the rugged highlands. The terrain was more challenging than previous landing sites, filled with slopes and boulders that tested both the astronauts and the lunar rover. Over three days, they conducted extensive geological surveys, driving nearly 27 kilometers and collecting over 95 kilograms of lunar samples. The mission yielded important surprises. What had been thought to be volcanic rocks turned out to be ancient crustal material, reshaping scientists' understanding of the moon's history. Apollo 16 showed that the highlands were not volcanic plains, but remnants of the moon's primordial crust, altered by countless impacts. Despite the difficulties, Apollo 16 was a resounding success, adding new layers of complexity to humanity's picture of the moon and proving once again that astronauts could overcome daunting challenges on the frontier of space. Apollo 17, launched in December 1972, was the last of the Apollo missions to the moon. The crew consisted of Eugene Cernan, Ronald Evans, and Harrison Schmidt. Schmidt, a geologist, was the only professional scientist ever to walk on the moon, underscoring NASA's growing emphasis on science. Their landing site in the Taurus Latrobe Valley combined mountainous terrain with geologically rich deposits. Cernan and Schmidt spent over three days on the lunar surface, conducting the longest moonwalks of the Apollo program and driving the lunar rover more than 35 kilometers. The samples they collected included orange-colored soil, evidence of ancient volcanic activity. Schmidt's expertise as a geologist allowed the crew to select samples with unprecedented precision, greatly enriching scientific knowledge of the moon's past. Cernan, as mission commander, became the last person to leave the lunar surface. Before climbing the ladder back into the lunar module, he delivered a message reflecting both pride and hope. Humanity would return, and the spirit of exploration would endure.
Apollo 17 closed the chapter on an era of human space exploration unmatched in daring and achievement. In just over three years, six missions had placed 12 men on the moon, gathered 382 kilograms of lunar material, and transformed our understanding of Earth's nearest neighbor. The Apollo program was more than a series of space flights. It was a demonstration of what humanity could achieve when driven by vision, competition, and cooperation. It advanced science, pioneered technologies, and inspired generations to look beyond the boundaries of Earth. From Neil Armstrong's first step to Eugene Cernan's final words, Apollo told a story of courage, discovery, and the relentless pursuit of the unknown. Though no human has walked on the moon since 1972, the legacy of Apollo continues to shape space exploration, guiding new missions that aim to return humanity to the moon and beyond.